they remain convinced of its truth, they were prepared to die for those truths if required. In our chapter today, we're going to see in the difficult times that were happening for the entire Jewish population in Persia. With Haman being the chief antagonistic antagonist, he was influencing Xerxes to exterminate the Jews. It was a shock to the system for all the Jewish people of that day. It required Mordecai and Esther to step up to the plate and do something before it was too late. Esther understood that God had put her in a position to do something and she was convinced that she was going to do something about it, even if it cost her a life. Esther prepared to enter the presence of the king on behalf of her people. She was prepared to pay the cost if required. It needed to bring attention to the plight of her people. Now it's a challenging when we think, would you and I have that same conviction, that same character to believe in something or someone to the point that we're willing to die for what we believe? You know, we say we are, but if it was put on us that if you don't give up your beliefs, you're going to die, or in the society in which we live, you're going to be cancelled, and we're seeing a lot of that, those who stand up for the truth and proclaim facts and stand on the truth, it's not with the narrative that people want to hear. It's not with the agenda being pushed. And it takes courage to stand against misinformation and mistruth. Would you be prepared to be cancelled for standing up for the truth? Or is it easier to remain silent? We like to think, if put under pressure, yep, I'll tell them what I think. But often it's in a crowd and it's with others who are pushing the same agenda and sometimes we just haven't got that courage. So a person with personal convictions is convinced something is true and stands on that principle regardless of the situation, regardless of the circumstances. And so it's interesting that personal convictions reveal a lot about a person's character. In other words, who they are. Having personal convictions is important to keep us from being swayed by the opinions of others and automatically doing what they say. Everyone has opinions and preferences, but a person with conviction does not form his ideas based on selfish desires or selfish gain. A person with personal convictions has thought through the issues and lives with a purpose. Such people are sure of what they believe. They're convinced that these things matter. Now we're going to travel with Esther and see how it works out for her because she was put under pressure to be able to take a stand against the current trends of the day and particularly um, a person like Haman who was the second most powerful man in the kingdom. A practical consideration on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes, stood in the inner courtyard of the king's palace, facing the king's hall. The king was sitting on his throne, royal throne, in the hall, facing the door. That's the situation. Now, breaking it down, I want us to see, first of all, in this practical consideration, in the previous chapter, she was told that basically you've been saved for a time such as this. You're not going to escape. You're not going to hide who you are. You're going to have to stand up or die. And so she's decided after having a time of prayer, three days of prayer and fasting, with the people and with Mordecai, that she would now go and see the king. And I want us to see, first of all, her persistence on the third day. Before she did anything, she prayed and fasted. And prayer and fasting plays an important part in Esther and Mordecai's preparation for what is about to happen. 
They just didn't go off. They just didn't go and do their own thing. They didn't act on their emotions. They brought it before the Lord. They wanted to seek his advice. Now, why would they do such a thing? Because they're stepping into the unknown. These times were out of their control. And because they didn't have plan A, B or C, and they didn't really know where to go or what to do about it, they were seeking guidance and assistance from the only person who could help them. So rather than acting on her emotions, she sought God's intervention. And she went about preparing herself to the best of her abilities. She understood what she was going to do, and she knew the consequences if she got it wrong, because the consequences would not only affect her, but her people also. So whatever she did had a knock-on effect, and she was considering all things. But she was persistent. She went on the third day. Her preparation. Now, it seems simple. We're told Esther put on a royal robe, stood on the inner courtyard of the king's palace, facing the king's hall. Now, when you're going before a king, what should you make sure you do about your appearance? You need to make sure you're at your best. You don't go in your pajamas. You don't go in your lounge clothes. You don't go in sackcloth and ashes. That's a big no-no. So here we see her preparation. She took the time to make sure everything that was under her control was done. She made sure she observed all the protocols and practices that were required of those who approached the king. She knew how important it was to appear in the right clothes if she wanted the king to accept and receive her because she knew being in the palace what was acceptable and what wasn't. So she took a time. She prepared the best clothes that she had to wear. She made sure her appearance was the best it could be for entering the presence of the king. Now, what does that tell us about Esther? It shows us something about her heart attitude, the way she went about preparing. If her heart wasn't right, then no matter what attention she put into her appearance, wasn't going to help her if her attitude was wrong. She was going to do and be the best that she could be. And that's challenging for us today. When we come into God's presence, when we appear before our King, do we go about preparing ourselves in the best way that we can? Do we show our commitment and our understanding of the one whose presence we're going into? Sometimes I don't think we do. We go in whatever clothes we're on, it's only church, it's only this, it's only that, Yet, it's a double standard because if I go to work, there's a certain standard or expectation that's required. And yet, when I go before the King of Kings, what do I wear? How do I prepare myself? Do I do the very best that I can, knowing that I'm going in his presence? Well, it shows the heart attitude of Esther. She prepared herself the best she could. Then we see her presence. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the doorway. Now I can imagine the trepidation and the anxiety that's filling Esther's mind as she's going to the throne room to meet the king. Now it's interesting, she didn't waste her time going through the court officials to make an appointment or a committee to seek permission 
to have an audience with the king, who just happened to be a husband. Now, think about that for a moment. If you're full of anxiety, if you're full of trepidation, what do you do? Often, you will seek the advice of others, won't you? You will talk it through, and there's nothing wrong with that. But she didn't seek the advice of others around her. And she didn't ask her opinion, well, do you think that I'm doing the right thing by going unannounced to the king? Because maybe those around her would have said, oh, that's stupid, that's a stupid idea. Have you got a death wish? You don't do that sort of thing. So don't do it. That would have only added to the tension she was always feeling. Others would say, look, there's a better way of doing this. Why don't you go and find somebody who has been through a similar situation that can give you some pointers? That's usually what we, we want. Find somebody who's gone through and experienced a circumstance so we can learn the ropes. Even though she had the courage of her convictions, I think she would have had the what-if moments, as I call them, to, as she prepared herself. You know, the mind's a powerful thing. What if this goes wrong? What if he doesn't want an audience? What if he doesn't want to sing? What if one of the guards stop me? What if this happens? What if that happens? Would this be the last time she would wear these royal clothes? Would this be the last time that she walked through the halls of the palace? Is this the last thing she would ever do on earth? A lot of what ifs. It wasn't going to be easy for Esther when she faced the king. And why I say that is, she had so many things that she had to tell the king who just happened to be a husband, in order to accomplish her mission. And you might be thinking, well, what things did she have to come clean about? Well, first of all, Esther had to break the Persian law to speak to the king, for which the penalty was death. Then she had to make her appeal. She had to confess to the king, her husband, she had deceived him by not telling her telling him she was a Jew. Ouch, that's going to hurt. She had to convince her husband to reverse a royal Persian law that he had signed and was considered irreversible. She had to take on a powerful opponent whose power and resources were second only to her husband, the king. Now she had to present a smart plan that would also lessen the pain of the king's pride when he finds out he's been duped by Haman. And I thought, good luck with all that. But you can see that's a lot on your plate. For the mind to put it all together and have the courage, she's going to expose herself in a big way, and she's not sure what the outcomes are going to be. But she had to have the courage to persist in achieving her objectives. Then we have the personal compliance. When the king saw Queen Esther standing in the courtyard, he was pleased. He held out to her, the golden scepter was in his hand, so Esther went forward and touched the end of it. Now, I want us to note here, she complied. And when the king saw her, the pleasure, that's what I called it. When king, the king saw Queen Esther standing in the courtyard, he was pleased. Consider Esther's position just for a moment. She's approaching the throne room. She can see the king sitting on his throne. Her heart is beating rapidly as she approaches, hoping the king would grant her permission, hoping that he would accept her unannounced 
even though she was his wife. That's a lot of what ifs to deal with, but it shows the tension, it shows the pressure of the situation. She had done everything to prepare herself that she could. Everything now rested in God's hands. She had prayerfully committed herself for three days. She was at peace with whatever happened, knowing she had stood up for what she believed and was right for her and her people. Now, our text says Xerxes was pleased when he saw her standing, waiting to be received. And the original Hebrew word carries the idea, when he saw her, it knocked the socks off him. Not because he was surprised, it's just the vision that he had of Esther that blew him away. That's the idea. She was a knockout. And he just couldn't take his eyes off her. So he just put forward the scepter. So you might be thinking, well, yeah, she had nothing to worry about. But no, she had prepared herself in prayer. And the idea here is that he was very pleased to see her. Maybe he was having a bad day in court. And she was a vision of loveliness that decided to distract him and he couldn't care less about what was happening now. He only had focused on this lovely person before him who just happened to be his wife. Now remember, she hadn't seen him for 33 days and now she appears. So yes, he's pleased. His day was improving and it could only get better from this point. He was delighted, if you like, to have this distraction from the palace duties. Now, it's also a reminder to us as believers, we have access to the throne of God 24-7. He delights for us to spend time in his presence, especially when we are in need. Then we have the permission. He held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand, so Esther went forward and touched the end of it. Xerxes had no problems in extending his scepter to Esther to approve his acceptance of her as a friend and not an enemy. Now, Esther was wise enough to accept the king's favour. She recognised his authority as king. She didn't take it for granted. She didn't feel that she had special privileges just because she was his wife. She showed her gratitude for his grace in allowing her to have an audience with him even though it hadn't been scheduled. Esther observed all the required protocols, even though he was her husband. She went forward, she touched the tip of the scepter, she received his grace for such an appearance. This also reminds us that as believers, we should never take for granted the privilege that we have to go before the throne of grace 24-7. It's a privilege, it's not a right, it's not a place where we demand. We need to understand and acknowledge this is our king and we need to respect that authority and that grace. We should never forget who we're approaching and it's only by his grace we come and make our request known to him and we honour him and worship him as king in the best way we can. Then we have a promise under control. The king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What do you want to ask me? I'll give you as much as half my kingdom. Esther answered, my king, if it pleases you, come today with Haman to a banquet that I've prepared for you. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly so we may do what Esther asked. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared for them. Immediately, that shows you the influence that Esther had upon the king, and it was immediate. He had no hesitation in accepting her presence, which would have put her very anxious mind at rest. Not only was he willing to listen to whatever request she was ready to make, but it would also give her the confidence she needed to move forward with her objective. She had the promise of the king 
who said he would meet her need. He was in a position of power and influence to provide her with whatever she wanted. Now, Xerxes, we know, had the capacity and potential, and at many different times, acted like a petulant child with his temper tantrums. He had many resources at his disposal. They were extensive. They reached throughout the kingdom. And he could do whatever he said he wanted to do when it came to giving people their requests. The same principle applies for us as God's children today. We can approach him with a confidence knowing we can ask whatever we will, if it's according to his will, then he will answer our prayers. Now, this goes against the name it and claim it model. All of the prosperity gospel as it's known, which tells us that we can use the power of faith to create our own reality to get what we want in life. So instead of, and I'm summarizing this, so instead of trusting in a holy and sovereign God, no matter how difficult our circumstances may be, we use our faith as a way of controlling God to give us what we want. Faith then becomes a force to get what we want rather than trusting a God in times of trial when we don't like them or want them. This philosophy proposes that what you think or believe is ultimately what controls what will happen to you. For example, if you have negative thoughts, you lack faith and you won't get what you want. However, if you have positive thoughts, then you have enough faith and you have health, wealth and happiness right now. The name and claim it approach to life and prayer is false. It is teaching that God wants to bless you with health, wealth and happiness, but he cannot do so unless you have enough faith. This means that God is no longer in control. You are. You just have to exercise enough faith. The scriptures teach us that God doesn't depend on a person's faith to act. He blesses those he wants to bless. He heals those he wants to heal without any manipulation being done on the part of the recipient. It's a false view of what the scriptures teach. Because of the faulty relationship that they have between God and man. If the prosperity gospel is true, there's no need for grace, there's no need for God because man is in control of all these things. He just must exercise enough faith to go and get what he wants because they say this is what God wants us to do. This is not how it works. The point is, he was a king who had all the resources at his fingertips and he's willing to use it. God has all the resources available, but it doesn't mean he's going to give us what we want just because we ask. Now, as a parent, I learned I don't give my children everything they want just because they ask for it. And our Heavenly Father is not going to give us everything we want just because we simply ask. He'll give us what we need when we need it and because we need it, not before. The proposal. The king asked, Of the proposal of the promise. I'm behind. The proposal. Esther answered, My king, if it pleases you, come today with Haman to a banquet that I've prepared for you. Now, put yourself in Esther's situation. If the king had said, Look, I'm ready to give you half my kingdom, just tell me what you want. What would you do? I mean, you're there for a purpose. Wouldn't it be tempting just to let him have it? Just spill the beans? Get it out? Tell him what you want. Tell the opportunity. Tell him what's going on. 
Esther didn't. She acted with caution. Maybe because she hadn't figured it all out yet. She was going to tell her husband what was happening while at the same time she was exposing Haman, the second most powerful person in the kingdom, about what he was doing. So she invites him to a banquet, knowing, hey, they like food. As they often say, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Why? He liked food. And Xerxes was known for his party. He knew, he knows how to have a good time. So as his wife, she invites him to a banquet. Good way to get down to get a person to let down their guard or resistance while they're eating, while they're conversing. Good food, good company. But it would require careful planning. It would require careful courage to confront Haman with his evil plans in a face-to-face -face confrontation. So Esther knew it was vitally important for Haman to be physically present when she revealed her case to the king. So she proposed a banquet, put everyone in a relaxed state of mind and prayed that when she made a case known to the king, he would choose her over Haman. The king reacted, the participation and the king said, bring Haman quickly so we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared for them. So it wasn't a problem. The king accepted the proposal. He had no problem. And he sent word to Haman for himself. Get over here pronto. We're going to a banquet with the queen. So I, knew, I guess that once Haman got the message, he knew better than to dally. So... And he would have been happy to be able to get this invitation, but just a little bit on the curious side as well, that he'd been invited to a banquet like this. So by using a ploy inviting them to this first banquet, they would have been at ease. And it would put Haman's mind at rest so that he's not smelling rats. He would be lulled into a false sense of security. But what it does show is the influence that Esther had on Xerxes to get him to drop everything and summon Haman and go to lunch with the queen. So it's pretty good. The proposed courtesy, what? What happened there? That was the end of it, was it? I must have short circuited it. Right down to the last one. 